Uh, so we're going to start off with talking about how you quantify expression in single cells. So we're, I'm just going to assume you've done your experiment, you've got back your FASTQ files from your sequencing facility, and now you need to figure out what to do with them. Okay, so that's where we're starting. Yeah, so this is me. Uh, if you want to contact me, I'm at UWO. Uh, feel free to. Um, but I promise, make no promises about how much time I have. Um, so I, I know we're supposed to be learning objectives. I don't like learning objectives. You've all decided to come here and spent a bunch of money to come here. So I want you to think about what you want to learn and what you want to get out of coming here. Uh, and I want everyone to spend a minute or two and post on the Slack channel one thing that you want to learn while being here. Yeah, I think most people have done that. So I will read those tonight and I will make sure I answer all of them tomorrow. Right? Even if it's not covered in lectures, I'll, I'll men mention something about it tomorrow. All right, so starting off with uh, understanding how we're gonna analyze these data, we have to under understand how we generated these data. So uh, Trevor nicely covered most of this already, but we start with our single cells. We extract the RNA, we convert that to cDNA, we amplify it, we generate a sequencing library, sequence it to get a bunch of reads, and then we're gonna quantify those reads to generate a UMI count matrix. We have cells by genes, and we have the count of the number of different molecules we saw for each of those genes and each of those cells. All right, so starting off at the front, um, Trevor already mostly covered this, so we have full length tag and tag based methods. For full length methods, you can analyze them the exact same way as you would analyze bulk RNA seq, only you have to automate all of your scripts so you can loop over several hundred files instead of doing them one at a time. So we're not gonna talk about that anymore. Instead, we're gonna talk about tag-based methods uh, for three prime or five prime, All right? So here's our mRNA molecule. So how are we actually gonna capture this mRNA molecule? So we're gonna hybridize it to a poly DT sequence that has a UMI attached to it. So UMI is a unique molecular identifier. These are randomly sequenced uh, ran randomly synthesized sequences between eight and 12 base pairs long, depending on which technology and which version of that technology you're using, giving us more than 50,000 possible combinations. So in theory, we have a unique barcode for every single mRNA molecule we're gonna capture. In practice, this isn't quite true because randomly synthesized does not mean equally likely randomly synthesized. So we do have biases towards certain sequences for EOMIs. So we tend to com combine both the UMI with the location that that mRNA transcript is gonna map in the genome to identify a unique mRNA molecule that we captured in our experiment. We're then gonna have our cell barcode. So this is a 40, 14 to 18 base pair sequence, again, depending on the technology and version you're using. And these are predetermined pools of sequences that are deliberately generated so that each one of them is at least two base pairs different from any other one. This allows us to do some error correcting because sequencing is not perfect. We will get some sequencing errors and have a sequencing error in our cell barcode is a big problem because we could get a read from a T cell being assigned to a endothelial cell if there's an error in that cell barcode. So we always have two base pair differences between the barcodes and then we can aggregate 
all the barcodes that are one base pair difference from each other into one cell and know that, that they all came from one cell and that one base pair difference is just a sequencing error. Because these are from a predetermined pool, we're gonna need to know what that pool is. So for if you're doing 10 extranomics uh, with Chromium, you can go to their website, figure out what version you're using and download the appropriate whitelist of barcodes as part of that method. If you're using a different technology, you'll have to find what whitelist uh, barcodes they are using for that technology. And you can see, depending on the version, these are different lengths and they're different sequences. So you do need to make sure you have the right one. Cell Ranger now has most of these built in and will automatically try and guess which whitelist you're using, but it's always preferable to know ahead of time and tell it the right one so that you have 0% chance of it guessing the wrong one. Okay, so we've got our cell barcodes. Then we have a 10X barcode that's gonna label which sample this is. So there's 96 different ones. So you can do 96 different Cell Ranger experiments and pull them all together and sequence them on one um, sequencing machine or one sequencing run. There are 10 base pair sequences uh, and we tend to just let the sequencing facility handle those and demultiplexing them for us. Then we get our PCR primers that we're gonna use to amplify the ever loving nonsense out of our mRNA molecules so that we go from picograms to nanograms of RNA or more for our sequencing libraries. So once we've got these hybridized, we, we also have a reverse transcriptase primer attached to this that allows reverse transcriptase to start and create a cDNA sequence of our mRNA, and then it adds a bunch of Cs at the end. So we also have to add a switch oligo that hybridizes to those poly Cs and gives reverse trans transcriptase a primer to go the other way and do our second strand synthesis. Okay. And we have our nice cDNA with PCR primers and we can amplify them. Yep, so then we do our amplification. So we're gonna amplify this 12 to 15 times with PCR. So obviously any sort of noise you have in your P PCR efficiency is gonna get amplified as well. This is why we have these unique molecular identifiers so that we can get rid of all of the noise created by this amplification by counting the UMIs instead of counting the reads we get at the end. Then we're gonna do our library preparation. If we're using Illumina sequencing, that means we're gonna fragment this into 300 base pair fragments, roughly. And then we're gonna do our sequencing using paired end sequencing, generating two 100 base pair reads. Uh, although some sequencing facilities now have specially designed protocols just for 10X data, and we'll sequence just the exact length you need for each of the reads. All right, so what are our reads gonna look like? So here's our 300 base pair fragment. You can see we, because all our barcodes are attached to our poly A tail, our poly DT sequence, we are only gonna amplify this, these fragments to generate our sequencing library because these we can assign back to our unique cells. All of the other fragments that came from this transcript, we can't tell what cell they came from. So they're useless to us. So our first read is gonna capture all of our barcodes and some poly DT sequence. And our second read is gonna be 100 base pairs somewhere near the three prime end of our transcript. We'll also get an I read. So our I read contains our sample index our sample barcode, so that's an orange there. Uh, it's actually completely uh, superfluous. You don't actually need it. Uh, you only need read one and read two. All right, so that was for three prime single cell RNA seq. So, how do we do five prime? Well, we do the exact same thing, only all of our barcodes we instead attach to our switch oligonucleotide. Okay, so they just go over there. Then our reads are going to be read one is at this end, getting all of our barcodes, and read two is going to be at the five prime end of our transcript. Everything else is exactly the same. So any bias due to poly T selection, poly A selection, is still going to be there. Any bias due to 
not um, reverse transcribing the entire mRNA will still be there. All right, so now that you know how that works, what would you expect your sequencing data and your count matrix to look like if there was a problem with the tissue handling and all the mRNA in your sample is highly degraded and broken down into small fragments before you're able to reverse transcribe it? Give me a few minutes to think about that. Yep, we have an answer. So the answer is, would the amplified fragments be too small to sequence? Possibly if it was super, super degraded. But often they'll still be 300 base pairs long, so you can sequence them. Yeah. Oh, possibly losing the identifiers. No, the identifiers are attached to our the oligos we're adding that are going to hybridize, so they'll always be there. Yeah. Would you be essentially losing like the middle of the mRNA? You're only being able to attach um, these markers to the end of, of the mRNA. So everything in the middle is something. Yes, yeah, so you'll be losing the middle of the mRNA. The other thing you'll tend to see is your read that's supposed to be in the gene will start having the poly A tail on it. So you'll start seeing lots of reads with lots of A's and T's in them. So what if you use the wrong cell barcode whitelist? How much you think about that? Or Simon, yes. Yeah, so lots of your reads will not match to any cell. So you'll be throwing away like 70 or 80% of your reads because cell ranger will not be able to map them to a cell. And what would happen if there's a strong bias towards certain sequences when generating the UMIs? Yeah. So would we overcount? Under, yes. We would undercount the amount of uh, mRNA molecules we actually capture because we'll get more mRNA molecules with the same UMI. Okay, so we've done. Uh, so the basic premise of single cell RNA seq, and most of the time we're going to be using this to get mRNA. But that's not the only thing people have tried to do with it. 
So we can definitely get mRNA with single cell RNA-seq because it has nice long poly A tails. We can also get mitochondrial RNA that also, also has poly A tails. We can't get microRNAs, it's just not possible. Nor can we get tRNAs or rRNAs. However, when it comes to viral transcripts, it's a bit up in the air. So some, or in fact, many viral transcripts are quite AT rich. So you can get some reads from them in single cell RNA-seq. However, so far, it's not very many. So it's sort of borderline detectable whether you can detect, uh, see a virus infecting your cells or not. And bacterial transcripts are the same. Some bacteria you can sequence quite easily with single cell RNA-seq. Other bacteria are much more difficult and you need a special protocol to do so. Okay, so now to quantify our gene expression. So we've got our sequencing reads back. We can understand what those reads look like. So now it's time to start quantifying them. So first, what we're gonna do is map the reads to the transcriptome. When we're doing this, you need to take into consideration what genome you wanna use. If you're using, say, a knock-in mouse that has a novel human gene inserted into the genome, well, you're going to need to add that gene to your reference genome if you actually want to quantify the expression of it. You also need to consider the annotation quality. So if you've got mouse or human, that's not really a big deal. But if you're using a non-model species, this can be a big problem, particularly because we're only sequencing one end of the transcript. So if you're, a bunch of your transcripts have long UTRs, that have not been noticed yet, you could lose a lot, of a lot of reads and a lot of genes because most of your reads are not mapping to what's annotated as the gene body. So you may want to consider redoing your, your annotation if you're using sort of a, a not so great genome and for a species that's not typical. You also need to consider whether you want to include introns and exons or just exons. It used to be the answer was exons only if you're doing single cell, both if you're doing a uh, single nucleus. However, these days they've changed the rules and now by default cell ranger will include both because you get 20% more reads even with a single cell if you also include the introns. And there are now also many methods that use the intronic versus exonic information. So um, Dr. Pugh mentioned SCVLO, for that method, you need to quantify both intron and exon reads separately to use that method. And then gonna assign the reads to cells. Right, so this, you just need the correct whitelist for your cell barcodes. And then you're gonna count the UMIs. So when we're counting UMIs, one of the big questions is how to deal with multi-mapping reads. Right, you can have a read that maps to three different genes which gene gets that UMI count for that read. The current uh, rule by Cell Ranger is it doesn't count for any of them. It just removes all multi-mapping reads. This is known to cause the opposite bias, where if you have a gene that has a close homolog in your genome, you'll actually get an undercounting of those that gene because a lot of the reads are mapping are multi-mapping between the two homologs. And then dealing with sequencing errors in your UMIs. So currently, Cell Ranger will assume that you can have up to one base pair um, error in your UMIs when it's counting. And we'll correct for that. So I've been talking a lot about Cell Ranger because that's what most people use for 10x data, which is what most people are using. But alternatives exist. Uh, so there's also Star Solo that mimics what Cell Ranger does, but is completely open source and much easier to modify any of the parameters. So particularly, for instance, if you have a species that isn't quite the same as your reference genome or a strain that isn't quite the same as your reference genome, for Star Solo, you could change the tolerance for mismatches. So if you're getting a lot of reads that are getting thrown out because there's too many mismatches, use star solo, you can change those parameters and get more of your reads mapping. And there's also Alvin, uh, which is much faster, uh, which is super fast, but it's a very different idea compared to Cell Ranger and Star Solo. So I'm not going to go into what Alvin does. If you want to look at Alvin, you can go look at Alvin and talk about it later. Okay. 
So I've been talking about sequencing errors, and which might seem a bit odd to people uh, who are familiar with sequencing, because sequencing these days is generally 99.9% .9 accurate. But when I'm talking about sequencing errors, I'm actually talking about all the errors between our, our mRNA molecules and our sequencing reads. So you can get errors from re reverse transcriptase. We can get errors by DNA polymerase when we're amplifying our sequences. And then we can get errors from the actual sequencing machine. So while the errors from the sequencing machine are very low, errors at the other steps are not necessarily that low. Right. So this is one example of uh, how it's not actually 99.9% .9 accurate. So this is some uh, single cell RNA-seq data. Uh, it'll look very different from what you're used to because this is the old fashioned SmartSeq2 version. But you can see here that we have the mean expression across the x-axis and the proportion of cells that that gene is detected in on the y-axis. And you see we have this nice solid curve where most of the genes are. In fact, like 95% of the genes are in this main curve. But then there is 5% of the genes that are not, that are on this curve that shifted to the left. So that our average expression is too low or unusually low compared to uh, the proportion of cells where it's detected. In. And if you look at what those genes are, they're process pseudogenes. So process pseudogenes are genes that um, mRNAs that have been subject to reverse transcription in, in the cell and then re-embedded into the genome. So they have the whole exonic sequence, but they have no promoter, no enhancer, or anything else. So they can't be expressed. There's no way for a transcription factor or uh, RNA polymerase to bind to them. So why are we detecting them? Well, because of mismatching genes, mi mismatching reads. So while all of the, these reads should be matching to the gene that actually is transcribed, a small portion of them are actually mapping to the process pseudogene. And if you calculate it out, it's about 4% of the reads will mismatch in this way. And if we assume a 1% sequencing error rate, uh, that gives uh, a 100 base pair read, gives us 4% of the reads having three or more sequencing errors, which could cause us, because this was also only uniquely mapping genes. This was excluding multi-mapping genes multi-mapping reads. And it's for this reason that if you use the default genome provided by Cell Ranger, all of the pseudogenes and process pseudogenes have been removed from that genome and are, math, and are masked uh, because of this mismapping mis error problem. And once we've quantified our reads, now we need to identify our cells. And the reason we have to do this is because if you look at this barcode rank plot, so these are our cell barcodes across the x-axis, ordered from most UMIs to least UMIs, and then total UMI counts on the y-axis. And you can see that we have some UMIs for over 100,000 different cell barcodes. But we only loaded to capture uh, 10,000 cells. So why do we have reads for so many droplets that shouldn't have a cell in them? So I have to go back to how these droplets are actually generated. So we take we generate these droplets by flowing together our barcoded beads and our cells, generating these little droplets that are pinched off by oil. And this happens at hundreds of droplets per second in our 10x chromine machine. And in all these diagrams, we always show that we we get one cell and one barcoded bead in each droplet. But that's just the ideal case. That's not reality. So what actually happens is about 5% of our droplets have a barcoded bead and a cell in them. And in addition to that, all of them have what's known as ambient RNA. Because when we're handling our cells and when we're extracting them from our tissue, some of those cells are going to get broken even if it's just while they're flowing through these um, microflow devices at super high speed, some of them are going to get broken. They're going to release that RNA, and it's going to be floating around in the supernatant with our cells. 
So when, he, when we pinch off a droplet, we're getting both this RNA in the cell and the RNA floating around in that supernatant. And that's going to be our ambient RNA. Right? Most of the time, so like 95% of the time, almost, our droplets are, are considered empty. So many, about 20% of them will have only ambient RNA and nothing else in them. But 75% of the time, we will have a barcoded bead with its capture of oligonucleotides and some ambient RNA in it, which means this barcoded bead can now capture that ambient RNA and generate cDNAs that then get UMIs and add, go into our sequencing library and end up our, our sequencing data results. We can also get doublets. So this is when one droplet has two cells and one barcoded bead. It's much less common than having one cell, but it's something we can't ignore and we'll come to later in the talk. We can also have what's known as a barcode multiplet, where we have one droplet with two barcoded beads in a single cell. And that's actually much more common than having doublets. However, nobody really knew about this until someone actually looked at what was in the droplets, because in the sequencing data, you can't actually tell this apart from having two cells. Right? This looks like we have two copies of that ye yellow cell in our sequencing data. And there's no way to tell that that has happened or not. So we just have to sort of accept that our data is full of duplicates that we don't know about. Yes, yeah, so we'll essentially have two cells that have almost the same um, gene expression because they came from the same droplet. They have the same cell. They're, they're measuring the same cell. Except for all of the noise, of course, the sampling noise of which RNAs hybridize to which bead, which ones get sequenced. And all of that noise is so much that it's actually really hard to find these computationally. In fact, that I don't know if anyone has actually found them computationally. But the bead have capacity, like when it's the one drop, to combine one cell only or like multiple? So you could have multiple cells and multiple beads at the same time as well, but that's going to be even less common. But once it's in that droplet, every, R every mRNA in that droplet is considered equal. They all have the equal chance of binding to either of those beads. So this will be the first type of error that we can't do anything about. So I'll give you all a few minutes to think about how you could change your experimental design to affect the number of doublets you get, affect the number of cells you capture, and affect the amount of ambient RNA you get in your experiment. Yeah. What's the response from gaming and the accuracy and effectiveness of the light from the one you are talking about, right? Even though you can see the number of very thin in that. Yes. Yes, yeah, so even if you, this, these aren't doublets because two cells are stuck together. They're doublets because just by random chance, when that oil pinched off, there were two cells in that droplet. Because the, both the beads and the cells are just randomly pinched off into these, into these droplets. So just by chance, we get some. And feel free to discuss with your neighbor the answer to these questions if, if you'd find that helpful. Yeah. 
Okay, I think everyone's had a chance to think about these. So the number of doublets, how could you design your experiment to increase or decrease the number of doublets? Yeah. Um, by changing the sort of rate, <clears throat> pardon me, the rate that cells flow in, so to get more cell flow rate, we have more doublets, I think. Changing the flow rate. Changing the flow rate would have a small effect. It's mostly the um, ratio between the flow rate and the number of cells you have right so the higher the concentration of cells you have the more doublets you'll have but if you increase the flow rate you might be able to spread those out so you'll get fewer doublets so it's an interaction between the two what the number of cells captured no answers from the audience so the number of cells captured, again, you can change the concentration of your cells, or you can also change the length of time that you're running the machine and how many droplets you're, cap you're generating. Right? If you generate 10,000 droplets, you'll collect a small number of cells. If you generate 100,000 doublets, you'll, uh, droplets, you'll get more. If you generate a million droplets, you'll get even more cells. And then the amount of ambient RNA, yeah? Yeah, so viability count would certainly help. You could decide whether your experiment is has enough viability to use that sample or not. Yeah, you could also flow sort your cells to remove any debris before you put them on the machine. And you can change how you're doing your dissociation protocol. There's lots of different protocols. There's lots of different reagents you can use. You can tweak a lot of things to try and reduce the amount of ambient RNA you have. Yeah? So, carry on sequence of RNA. Uh, are there extra green processes just to make sure you don't have that ambient RNA from stuff like this or just uh, rather than stuff? Yeah, so for frozen samples, often people will flow sort them to remove the damaged cells. Or they'll just put up with the fat. Or the the other option is to thaw them as short a time as possible before putting them on the 10x machine, so that if you do have that lysis, it has the least chance of diffusing across all your your data. Um, but usually, it's, it's flow sorting works better. Or you just put up with it. And try and find some computational method to deal with your ambient RNA. All right, so this slide is actually out of somewhat out of date. So this is sort of the current generation of cell range of uh, 10x. 
Um, the doublet rate depends on the amount of cells you load. So the more cells you load, the more doublets you'll get. The fewer cells you load, the fewer doublets you'll get. Most people aim for this uh, four to 5,000 cells captured per run target, where you get about three to 4% doublets. Um, however, it's 10x, of course, to, to be extra annoying for this course, just released a press release that they've got a new version. That's way better and has 20, 20 times fewer doublets and captures twice as many cells. Um, so there will be a new version of this table in about six months or so that will be completely different. Okay, so now we've talked about sort of problems. How are we actually going to figure out computationally which droplets had cells in them or not? So we almost always just use this barcode rank plot. So we have, again, our, our droplets across the x-axis, totally omised across the top axis. And you can see we have this sort of range at the top where we have a lot of cells with a lot of droplets with a lot of UMIs. And then we have this steep decline until we have a bunch of droplets with very low number of UMIs. So if we see something like that, we'd say, oh, well, all those things up there, those are cells. And everything down here is empty. So that's if we have a nice, clean experiment. Um, but we don't always have something that nice and clean. So we could have a case where our tissue contains cells of different sizes. Some cells might have a ton of RNA and be really big, like hepatocytes. Some of them might be really tiny and have very little RNA going on. So what's that going to look like? That looks like this. So we have our big cells up here. Then we have our little cells as a sort of secondary hump. And then we have our empty guys down here. But we could also have a sample where we have a lot of ambient RNA. If we look at high ambient RNA, we're again going to get the secondary hump where we have those drop the droplets capturing a lot of ambient RNA forming a secondary hump, and then our empty our way down here. Which hopefully you can see causes a problem, because if we see the secondary hump in our plot, we don't know if that's cells with low amounts of RNA or droplets with a lot of ambient RNA. So how can we tell these apart? So we're not going to use old version of Cell Ranger that just draws a threshold. Instead, we're going to use the new version of Cell Ranger that is based on empty drops. It's from uh, part of the cells in your sample getting broken. So the same cells, it's not like... Yeah, it's the same cells. It's not contamination from a different experiment. It's going to be still RNA from your tissue, but it's going to be sort of a mixture of all of your cells mixed together. And as a disclaimer, I am an author on the empty drops paper. Okay, so how does empty drops work? So what we do know is that these droplets down here with very, very few UMIs, they're definitely not cells, okay? So we can use those to estimate what our ambient RNA looks like because they should be capturing only ambient RNA, right? So we take all of those, pull them out, add them all together, to estimate our ambient RNA. And then we can look at the expression in each of our droplets and ask, is it different from the ambient RNA? And so we gen generate a statistical test to test, is it statistically significantly different from our ambient RNA? If it is, it's probably a cell. So that's what empty drops does. So here you can see this black line is what the ambient RNA looks like based on these droplets with very little RNA, uh, very low UMI counts. And we haven't read all of those droplets that were statistically significantly different from that ambient RNA. And those will be our putative cells, and we can keep those and run them. And we'll be able to capture both large and small cells this way. All right, so that's how we figure out which droplets contain cells or not. Now we need to figure out which of those droplets contain doublets or single cells. So but now that we're talking about doublets, I actually have to specify that there's two different types of doublets. Right? So there's heterotypic doublets, which are here at the top, where we have two different cells. So 
So one of these might be a T cell, one of them might be an epithelial cell. Or we can have a homotypic doublet where we have two of the same cell. So maybe we have two different T cells in that droplet. Computationally, this homotypic doublet with two cells of the same type is indistinguishable from a droplet that contains only one of those cells. So we can't actually identify those. So this is error type number two that we can't fix. However, we can identify these heterotypic doublets. There's a whole bunch of tools to do this. They all do essentially the same thing, just with slight variations. So the first thing they do is randomly generate doublets from the cells you measured. So it takes that area of real cells, randomly picks two of them, adds them together, they're a doublet. Now that you know you've got doublets from the synthetic generation method, you can train a classifier to identify those synthetic doublets. It can be any classifier, classifier you want. It could be logistic regression, it could be SVM, random forest, or neural networks. So different, different packages you'll find that do this will use different classifiers. But they all just train a classifier. Once you've got that classifier trained, you just run it on your observed cells and get its classification score for each of your observed cells to see whether they look like doublets or not. And once you've got that score, you just need to calculate the expected frequency of heterotypic doublets, right? Because this will depend on the number of cells you have as well as the number of cell types you have. If you have lots of different cell types, you'll have more heterotypic doublets. If you have few cell types, you'll have fewer heterotypic doublets. So calculate how many you expect to find. And then you draw a threshold on your uh, classification scores to say, above this threshold, you're a doublet. Below this threshold, you're not a doublet. So this, yeah. If you had a precursor cell that was differentiating, mm -hmm. and uh, your heterotypic doublet had yeah, that precursor cell and its progeny, for instance, how would you distinguish between those two things? You'd have a mixture of the same genes. Yes, yeah, so if you have a precursor cell and progeny in a doublet, then you might, you might be able to see that it's not quite fully the, the either one, the precursor or the daughter, but probably it's just going to look like a smear and you won't be able to find it. But you, it would look the same as the cell that was transitioning between those two. Things. Yeah, it'll look like a cell that's transitioning, and then um, you, you essentially won't be able to tell the difference. So they'll just be in there. Yeah. So the homotypic double, wouldn't those beads um, have essentially like double the amount of reads as compared to uh, the same cell type that had a single? Cell yeah, so would the homotypic doublets have twice as much, twice as many reads? In theory, yes. In practice, no. Um, uh, so if you look at the total EMI counts for doublets, they tend to be higher than say you could actually draw a line and distinguish them. So they're like 10% higher on average but there's a huge overlap. So if you try to draw a line, you get really poor classification. There's just too many other factors that go into how many UMIs you get. Any other questions? Uh, so these are a bunch of different methods. Um, this is a few years old, so there's probably more of them now. But if you look at all of these methods, they, they have a trade-off between time and accuracy. We're going to be using the finder in the lab, which has the highest accuracy. But I'll point out that the so even doublet finder, which is the best performing, isn't that great. Um, so generally, what I recommend doing for finding doublets is label your doublets with doublet finder, then do your clustering and find which clusters are enriched in doublets 
and then call that whole cluster a doublet cluster. It's going to help improve this accuracy because um, this accuracy is not very good at the single cell level. Yeah. Are there like cell types that bias towards doublets or is it completely So there's essentially two reasons you get doublets. One is you're randomly pinching off these droplets and there happens to be two cells in them. That there tends to not be any cell type bias as far as we can tell. However, you can also definitely get doublets where the cells are still stuck together. And there you will see a cell type bias. And you can actually calculate the frequency of doublets of a certain pairing of cell types and see where you have statistically more than you expect. And then you can sort of infer that those cell types tend to be stuck to each other for whatever reason. Uh, and we've actually seen that in the liver where we can see macrophages binding to endothelial cells. That's we have way more doublets of those than we expect to see. Um, yeah. Along that question, so there are other uh, significant studies to say, compare different tissue types in terms of tendency to form the doublet. Let's say tumor cells versus T cells. T cells generally in the blood parts, you know, flow as a single. So is there a systemic comparison across tissues? Not that I'm aware of. There was a few years ago, a group who was actually deliberately under dissociating their tissues to try and figure out the cell-cell contacts bought through the doublets they got because they didn't fully dissociate the tissue. So they, they were doing it, but they were doing sort of individual experiments, case by case basis. As far as I know, there's no systematic comparison across all of the tissues to look at the frequency of doublets between different cell types. So in my then discussion, I wonder if it's also um, from industry of the platform development portfolio as is there interesting to see um, surface modified cells. So, you know, when we modify the cells, even they randomly hit each other, but the chances for them to stay together is become significantly lower. So in that way, we probably can reduce the doublets. I don't know if then for the industry is a strong need to lower the fraction of the doublet to like say to even plus one percent. Uh, to lower the doublet chance? Um, most of them don't seem to care that much uh, because there are only a couple percent and you're sequencing 10,000 cells now in a per run. So 1% of that is not a big deal, um, especially because there are all these methods to remove them. Um, yeah, so most people don't seem to care about their doublet rate as long as it's not too high. Good. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's only true for if we do find some issues, like they have 5%, 10%, that maybe become issues to think an actual protocol to treat the symptoms. Yeah, yeah, potentially. If there was a, a case where it was a big problem, but usually you can just change the dissociation protocol to fix that at the cost of potentially killing some of your cells. Yeah. Any other questions about doublets? Yeah. And difference depending on your sample type. Mostly no, it's mostly and except for your dissociation protocol. So you can absolutely get different amounts of doublets depending on your dissociation protocol. For example, um, if you're using like the flex protocol and you're starting with like the same, mm -hmm. then obviously you're the whole tissue. And um, I guess it's still a different the surgery. Yeah. 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 It just depends on your dissociation. Otherwise, you, you just get the background rate from the technology itself. So there, it is also different between technologies. So I showed the rates for the 10x chromium. If you did drop seek, you would get a different rate of doublets. If you do parse bio, you get a different rate of doublets. If you do hive, you'll get a different rate of doublets. So whenever you're picking your technology, ask the reps what the doublet rate is. 
uh, and make sure it's acceptable. Okay, I don't see any other questions. All right, so, so to summarize, uh, single cell RNA-seq, uh, one read contains the barcodes, the other contains the genic se sequences. We do pair end sequencing, but when you're actually mapping it, it you treat it like single end because only one, one read will match to the genome. If you're not using mouse or human samples, check the quality of your genome and, and consider doing de novo transcript identification uh, in some cases. UMIs are crucial to remove noise from the many rounds of amplification. Um, it's They've been so successful in single cell, there are, people are actually trying to use them for bulk RNA-seq now as well. Three prime and five prime are essentially the same except for, um, PC, except for PCR amplification biases, depending on which end you're capturing uh, and which end the barcodes are located at. Didn't really talk about single cell versus single nuke because um, Trevor did that earlier, uh, but it will affect what kind of tra transcripts are captured. Most droplets will not contain one bead in one cell, so you're going to want to use something like empty drops to help identify your cell types, your cells from your, your droplets contain cells from the empty ones, and then you can use one of the various doublet identifying and di doublet identification methods to find your heterotypic doublets and remove them as well.